Did you know there's a relationship between herpes virus and Alzheimer's disease? What? Yeah. That's pretty crazy. So before we go into the relation between herpes virus and Alzheimer's disease, I thought we'd give a little background on each of those things separately. So Alzheimer's disease, you've probably heard of this. Maybe you know someone, have a loved one that's affected by this disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, and this means that um, your thinking ability is affected, and this can manifest in different ways. So people with dementia might have trouble remembering things or doing daily activities. They may have trouble controlling their emotions or um, concentrating on things. Mm -hmm. But it, dementia is a spectrum, and you might not show all of these symptoms, you might show just some of them. Um, so you don't have to have every single one of those. So is dementia like the umbrella for these memory loss disorders and Alzheimer's like one part of it? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so, but you're not going to show all the symptoms. So like my grandpa, for example, has dementia and he still is really killer at poker. <laughs> he hangs <laughs> up. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean that's pretty common actually that you have trouble learning new things but mm -hmm. maybe something that you're much more familiar with will be easier for you to do. So like my grandpa playing poker or my grandma like cook baking cookies, um, etc. So when do people normally start to show signs of Alzheimer's? It, usually late in life, this disease is, is progressive, so it doesn't show up until around usually age, age 65. And then when you sh start to show symptoms, it progressively gets mm -hmm. worse. Uh, but it can show up before age 65. It's called early onset dementia. Wow. So why do we get Alzheimer's disease? The verdict is still out completely, but we do have two clues that um, these two features show up in people in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. And those two features are these structures that appear in the brains. So one of them is called um, amyloid beta plaques, and one of them is called tau tangles. And basically what both of these are, are just clumps of disordered protein. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of amyloid beta, it's the amyloid beta pro protein, which is normally important for like learning and is present in the brain. Um, something goes wrong, maybe because of a mutation in that protein or the proteins that regulate it, um, it starts to clump up and form this disordered structure. And the A-beta plaques are actually found outside the cell, mm. um, but still in your brain. And then the tau tangles are an important part for the structure of the inside of the cell, but they can also be mutated, or again, the proteins that interact with them can become mutated, and it causes them to clump up and form these tangles. Um, so mutations in those proteins, as well as other proteins that interact with them, um, are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so how do scientists like diagnose Alzheimer's? Are they able to go in and see these plaques? That's a good question. Um, so while a person is alive, it's simply known as dementia um, because mm -hmm. The real diagnostic factor for Alzheimer's disease is the presence of these plaques and these tangles, and you can't see that unless you look directly at the brain tissue, which you can't do while the person is alive. Um, so they have to look at postmortem tissue. Um, so I mentioned these risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, risk factors are just that risk factors. So the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's is stronger if if you have some of these mutations, but it doesn't mean that you definitely right. will get Alzheimer's disease. There's definitely people that don't have any risk factors and they develop it versus people that um, have these known risk factors and don't develop it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the most commonly known risk factors is the ApoE gene. So normally the function of this um, protein is that it collects cholesterol and fats and it kind of traffics it to different places in your body through the bloodstream. Um, so if you have a particular mutation in this um, gene, it's called ApoE E4. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. But again, like there are people with this mutation that never right. develop the disease. And this is the mutation that they test for in 23andMe. So 
and they'll and they'll tell you also if you have the mutation in this gene it does not mean you're going to get alzheimer's it just means you are more likely to and um i mean there's also many other factors at play mm -hmm. like your epigenetics you can make healthy choices for yourself and um like improve your health and, and that can help too mm -hmm. so th it's genes and environment so let's get back to herpes how did that fit into <laughs> alzheimer's yeah so herpes is a virus and you probably know that viruses are these um tiny little things they can be 500 times smaller than a cell wow and they essentially consist of some kind of genome that can be dna or rna in mm -hmm. the case of herpes it's dna and it's double stranded so it can be just one strand of dna or two um and viruses can't replicate by themselves they don't have the machinery like ribosomes um, and such to to make protein from their genome so they require a host cell and they kind of hijack the cell machinery of that host to start making their own proteins. So this can be really stressful for the cell, um, which has to expend a lot of energy and resources mm -hmm. to make these proteins. You're using nucleotides, you're <laughs> using ATP. Um, it's basically like a teenager who comes home yeah. from the holidays. Eats, comes all home, eats all the food. You have to make more food. You have to do his laundry. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good, not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so not good for the cell, but the viruses aren't always actively replicating. They can also incorporate in your DNA and, and kind of hide for a while. Mm -hmm. And this is called being latent. Um, so not causing so much stress to the host. The host can survive as normal. So specifically, uh, herpes virus, there's a lot of different types of herpes virus. So HSV1 is probably the most common. This is herpes simplex virus 1. Um, it's the same virus that causes cold sores, and it's estimated that about 50% of individuals between ages 14 and 49 um, have been infected with this, mm -hmm. according to the CDC. <clears throat> and according to the World Health Organization, um, the numbers are about 3.7 billion worldwide. Wow. So, pretty common. Yeah, yeah. And does that mean they're always going to get cold sores very easily? No, or just... no, because the virus could be latent and mm. just in really stressful times, maybe you have an exam coming up, you're yeah. not sleeping, um, the cold sore might come up. Um, so another virus we're going to talk about is um, HHV6, and this is related to that herpes virus 1, but mm -hmm. uh, it mainly infects you during childhood, and it can cause like diarrhea and rashes and fever, um, and this actually affects most people, like wow. close to 100%, wow. um, have gotten this. And so is it more, it just like presents early on in childhood, goes latent, and, and then... Exactly, okay. exactly. And your immune system might kick it completely, but uh, in most people it can, it can stay latent. So we know about Alzheimer's and heartbeats, so right. how are they connected? Yeah, um, so I saw a recent news article saying that herpes could be causing Alzheimer's disease, which is... Whoa. <laughs> A little bit reaching uh, but it got me interested and I decided to go look at the papers myself and I was surprised to find there's actually a lot of research done um, on viruses and Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. if you look in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients you find a lot of viruses so wow. people have been kind of skeptical about this in the past because maybe the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients are just less healthy and less able to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe these viruses are just kind of opportunistic and... Right, not actually causing Alzheimer's, but maybe just taking advantage of the brain. Exactly. And I still don't think that, that these papers quite have convinced me that that might not be the case, but we'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> <laughs> the big paper that I spent most of my time reading was this paper that did this systems genetic approach, mm -hmm. which means that they looked at multiple levels so in systems genetics you look at the dna the rna the protein clinical data and you try to find connections between all of those things mm -hmm. um, so they used four very large cohorts across the u.s and um, looked at their dna if they had any of those risk factors we talked about um, looked at rna um, and not only the human DNA and RNA, but they were looking for viral DNA and RNA too. And they actually found that in a lot of the um, Alzheimer's disease patients that they looked at, 
um, they found the herpes virus 6, but they found a lot of other mm -hmm. viruses mm -hmm. that they like didn't focus on just because they found this herpes virus 6 was in all of them, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because we we all have we it. We all yeah. have it. Um, but so they are looking though specifically in the brain and seeing that it kind of aggregated yes. in the brain. Yes. Um, so another interesting thing about this study is they use what's called preclinical Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. tissue. So these changes that happen, these, these proteins that start clumping, actually start clumping much before you show any symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this preclinical tissue is from people with, with undiagnosed Alzheimer's disease. So they, when they did autopsy, they found that these patients had plaques even though they had mm. no issues with memory or cognitive wow. ability. Yeah. So as you can imagine, this tissue is like really rare to come by. Yeah. People aren't necessarily just like donating their brains to science if they don't have a disease. Yeah. Um, so it's really rare. So they kind of compared the normal brain to the Alzheimer disease brain to this preclinical brain. And we're looking for differences in the preclinical brain that maybe weren't there in the Alzheimer's mm. or the control brain. So it was kind of cool. like an indicator of this this person's going to develop Alzheimer's or this person's not really going to. Right. Um, and they found that in those early brains, especially, there was um, the herpes 6 virus, mm. but also it, it was also in the Alzheimer's disease brains. And this paper, one of the things that was cool was they they looked specifically at those risk factors and they found a positive association between the abundance of the virus and the presence of those risk factors. Wow. So yeah. if you have more virus, you also have more of those risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. It's a positive association, but it could be being driven by the risk factors. True. Because your brain is so unhealthy, you have more of yeah. this virus. So there's no way to say, okay, this is actually causing yeah. Alzheimer's. But it is kind of like a alarm bell to scientists that like wow this is really important that there's this mm -hmm. there's this connection and we should look at more into this and yeah. try to understand it so another thing that they didn't look at in this paper but in other papers really looked at the herpes virus mm -hmm. one um, which has also been found in alzheimer disease brain uh, they found that the virus specifically was found in these a beta plaques like when they use antibodies mm -hmm. to, to see where the virus yeah. was in the brain, um, it was specifically in the plaques. So, but not the tangles. Yes, yeah, so in these extracellular plaques. And people have done further studies and shown that um, these viruses can interact with the protein. So it, the A beta plaques may be kind of the body's response to, to protecting from this virus. They just mm. kind of coat the virus in mm -hmm. this cloak so that it can't infect the cells anymore. And that would make sense because you know, you're trying to prevent it, but then that would make sense why they're all clumping together too. Right, they're That's all concentrating towards this virus, yeah. which the A beta plaques, scientists are pretty sure that they're making the situation worse for these Alzheimer's patients. So in trying to protect right. the cells, they're actually making the situation way worse. A final caveat, the, the, I, didn't, I didn't look at all the studies, so I don't know, but the, the one on HHV6, herpes virus 6, um, they only use cohorts from the United States, mm -hmm. so it's important when looking at this disease that you know affects people worldwide. Um, we should be trying to choose a representative group, and yeah. maybe in the future we can use larger cohorts from different countries. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's still really interesting that like most of the cohorts they looked at, they saw this similar trend, and yeah, it's pretty striking. So. If these viruses really are playing a role in making the progression worse in Alzheimer's disease, this might open up a new avenue for treatment, actually, mm -hmm. because we've developed lots of different antivirals, and maybe treating these patients with antivirals could help them attack the, the virus so that the patients don't have to build mm -hmm. up these plaques yeah. and make the situation worse. Is there any talk of trying that with any patients, or maybe using it in mice? Yeah, people, so people have done some experiments with infecting mice with the herpes virus, and the, and the mice do get worse, which, mm. which lends credence to this study mm -hmm. that maybe the virus is promoting the progression of the disease. Right. But, I mean, to ultimately say that this virus is making the disease worse, we're going to need to start treating patients with antivirals and see if they get better. Mm-hmm.